Section six of La Semoire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. La Semoire by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest A. Visday. Second part of chapter two. Gervaise had taken up her basket again. She did not rise from her seat, however, but held the basket on her knees, with a vacant look in her eyes, and lost in thought, as though the young workman's words had awakened within her far-off thoughts of existence. And she said again, slowly, and without any apparent change of manner, "'Mon Dieu! I am not ambitious. I don't ask for much. My desire is to work in peace, always to have bread to eat, and a decent place to sleep in, you know, with a bed a table, and two chairs, nothing more. If I can, I'd like to raise my children to be good citizens. Also, I'd like not to be beaten up, if I ever again live with a man. It's not my idea of amusement. She pondered, thinking if there was anything else she wanted, but there wasn't anything of importance. Then, after a moment, she went on. Yes, when one reaches the end, one might wish to die in one's bed. For myself, having trudged through life, I should like to die in my bed, in my own home. And she rose from her seat. Coupeau, who cordially approved her wishes, was already standing up, anxious about the time. But they did not leave yet. Gervaise was curious enough to go to the far end of the room for a look at the big still behind the oak railing. It was chugging away in a little glassed-in courtyard. Coupeau explained its workings to her pointing at the different parts of the machinery, showing her the trickling of the small stream of limpid alcohol. Not a single gay puff of steam was coming forth from the endless coils. The breathing could barely be heard. It sounded muffled, as if from underground. It was like a somber worker, performing dark deeds in the bright daylight, strong but silent. My boots, accompanied by his two comrades, came to lean on the railing until they could get a place at the bar. He laughed, looking at the machine. Tonnerre de Dieu, that's clever. There's enough stuff in his big belly to last for weeks. He wouldn't mind if they just fixed the end of the tube in his mouth, so he could feel the fiery spirits flowing down to his heels like a river. It would be better than the tiny sips doled out by Père Colombe. His two comrades laughed with him, saying that my boots was quite a guy after all. The huge still continued to trickle forth its alcoholic sweat. Eventually it would invade the bar, flow out along the outer boulevards, and inundate the immense expanse of Paris. Gervaise stepped back, shivering. She tried to smile as she said, "'It's foolish, but that still and the liquor gives me the creeps.' Then, returning to the idea she nursed of a perfect happiness, she resumed, "'Now, ain't I right? It's much the nicest, isn't it, to have plenty of work, bread to eat, a home of one's own?' and to be able to bring up one's children, and to die in one's bed? "'And never to be beaten,' added Coupeau gaily. "'But I would never beat you, if you would only try me, Madame Gervaise. You've no cause for fear. I don't drink, and then I love you too much. Come, shall I be marriage? I'll get you divorced and make you my wife.' He was speaking low, whispering at the back of her neck, while she made her way through the crowd of men with her basket held before her. She kept shaking her head no, yet she turned around to smile at him, apparently happy to know that he never drank. Yes, certainly, she would say yes to him, except she had already sworn to herself never to start up with another man. Eventually they reached the door and went out. When they left, La Semois was packed to the door, spilling its hubbub of rough voices and its heavy smell of vitriol into the street. My boots could be heard railing at Père Colombe, calling him a scoundrel, and accusing him of only half filling his glass. He didn't have to come in here. He'd never come back. He suggested to his comrades a place near the Barrière Saint-Denis, where he drank good stuff straight. Ah, sighed Gervaise, when they reached the sidewalk. You can breathe out here. Good-bye, Monsieur Coupeau, and thank you. I must hurry now. He seized her hand as she started along the boulevard, insisting— Take a walk with me along Rue de la Goutte d'Or. It's not much farther for you. I've got to see my sister before going back to work. We'll keep each other company. In the end, 
Gervaise agreed, and they walked beside each other along the Rue de Poissonnier, although she did not take his arm. He told her about his family. His mother, an old vestmaker, now had to do housekeeping, because her eyesight was poor. Her birthday was the third of last month, and she was sixty-two. He was the youngest. One of his sisters, a widow of thirty-six, worked in a flower shop, and lived in the Batignol section, on Rue de Moine. The other sister was thirty years old now. She had married a dead-pan chainmaker named Laurier. That's where he was going now. They lived in a big tenement on the left side. He ate with them in the evenings. It saved a bit for all of them. But he had been invited out this evening, and he was going to tell her not to expect him. Gervaise, who was listening to him, suddenly interrupted him to ask, with a smile, "'So you're called Young Cassis, Monsieur Coupeau?' "'Oh,' replied he, "'it's a nickname my mates have given me, because I generally drink Cassis when they force me to accompany them to the wine-shop. It's no worse to be called Young Cassis than My Boots, is it?' "'Of course not. Young Cassis isn't an ugly name,' observed the young woman, and she questioned him about his work. He was still working there, behind the octroi wall at the new hospital. Oh, there was no want of work. He would not be finished there for a year at least. There were yards and yards of gutters. "'You know,' said he, "'I can see the Hôtel Bon Coeur when I'm up there. Yesterday you were at the window, and I waved my arms, but you didn't notice me.' They had already gone about a hundred paces along the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, when he stood still, and, raising his eyes, said, "'That's the house. I was born farther on, at number twenty-two. But this house is, all the same, a fine block of masonry. It's as big as a barrack inside.' Gervaise looked up, examining the façade. On the street side the tenement had five stories, each with fifteen windows whose black shutters with their broken slats gave an air of desolation to the wide expanse of wall. Four shops occupied the ground floor. To the right of the entrance a large, greasy hash-house, and to the left a coal-dealer, a notion-seller, and an umbrella merchant. The building appeared even larger than it was, because it had on each side a small, low building which seemed to lean against it for support. This immense, squared-off building was outlined against the sky. Its unplastered side walls were as bare as prison walls, except for rows of roughly jutting stones which suggested jaws full of decayed teeth yawning vacantly. Gervaise was gazing at the entrance with interest. The high, arched doorway rose to the second floor and opened on to a deep porch, at the end of which could be seen the pale daylight of a courtyard. This entrance way was paved like the street and down the centre flowed a streamlet of pink-stained water. "'Come in,' said Coupeau. "'No one will eat you.' Gervaise wanted to wait for him in the street. However, she could not resist going through the porch as far as the concierge's room on the right, and there, on the threshold, she raised her eyes. Inside, the building was six stories high, with four identical plain walls enclosing the broad central court. The drab walls were corroded by yellowish spots, and streaked by drippings from the roof gutters. The walls went straight up to the eaves, with no moulding or ornament, except the angles on the drain-pipes at each floor. Here the sink drains added their stains. The glass window-panes resembled murky water. Mattresses of checkered blue ticking were hanging out of several windows to air. Clothes-lines stretched from other windows, with family washing hanging to dry. On a third-floor line was a baby's diaper still implanted with filth. This crowded tenement was bursting at the seams, spilling out poverty and misery through every crevice. Each of the four walls had, at ground level, a narrow entrance, plastered without a trace of woodwork. This opened into a vestibule containing a dirt-encrusted staircase which spiralled upward. They were each labelled with one of the first four letters of the alphabet painted on the wall. Several large workshops, with weather-blackened skylights, were scattered about the court. Near the concierge's room was the dyeing establishment responsible for the pink streamlet. Puddles of water infested the courtyard, along with wood shavings and coal cinders. Grass and weeds grew between the paving stones. The unforgiving sunlight seemed to cut the court into two parts. On the shady side was a dripping water-tap, with three small hens scratching for worms with their filth-smeared claws. Gervaise slowly gazed about, lowering her glance from the sixth floor to the paving-stones, then raising it again, surprised at the vastness, 
feeling as it were in the midst of a living organ, in the very heart of a city, and interested in the house, as though it were a giant before her. "'Is Madame seeking for any one?' called out the inquisitive concierge, emerging from her room. The young woman explained that she was waiting for a friend. She returned to the street. Then, as Coupeau did not come, she went back to the courtyard, seized with the desire to take another look. She did not think the house ugly. Amongst the rags hanging from the windows she discovered various cheerful touches, a wallflower blooming in a pot, a cage of chirruping canaries, shaving-glasses shining like stars in the depth of the shadow. A carpenter was singing in his workshop, accompanied by the whining of his plane. The blacksmith's hammers were ringing rhythmically. In contrast to the apparent wretched poverty, at nearly every open window appeared the begrimed faces of laughing children. Women with peaceful faces could be seen bent over their sewing. The rooms were empty of men who had gone back to work after lunch. The whole tenement was tranquil, except for the sounds from the workshops below, which served as a sort of lullaby that went on, unceasingly, always the same. The only thing she did not like was the courtyard's dampness. She would want rooms at the rear, on the sunny side. Gervaise took a few more steps into the courtyard, inhaling the characteristic odour of the slums, comprised of dust and rotten garbage. But the sharp odour of the waste water from the dye shop was strong, and Gervaise thought it smelled better here than at the Hôtel Boncoeur. She chose a window for herself, the one at the far left, with a small window-box planted with scarlet runners. "'I'm afraid I've kept you waiting rather a long time,' said Coupeau, whom she suddenly heard close beside her. "'They always make an awful fuss whenever I don't dine with them, and it was worse than ever today, as my sister had bought some veal.' And as Gervaise had slightly started with surprise, he continued glancing around in his turn. "'You were looking at the house. It's always all let from the top to the bottom. There are three hundred lodges, I think. If I had any furniture, I would have secured a small room. One would be comfortable here, don't you think so?' "'Yes, one would be comfortable,' murmured Gervaise. "'In our street at Plaisance there weren't near so many people. Look, that's pretty, that window up on the fifth floor, with the scarlet runners.' The zinc-worker's obstinate desire made him ask her once more whether she would or she wouldn't. They could rent a place here as soon as they found a bed. She hurried out the arched entranceway, asking him not to start that subject again. There was as much chance of this building collapsing as there was of her sleeping under the same blanket with him. Still, when Coupeau left her in front of Madame Fouconnier's shop, he was allowed to hold her hand for a moment. For a month the young woman and the zinc-worker were the best of friends. He admired her courage when he beheld her half killing herself with work, keeping her children tidy and clean, and yet finding time at night to do a little sewing. Often other women were hopelessly messy, forever nibbling or gadding about, but she wasn't like them at all. She was much too serious. Then she would laugh and modestly defend herself. It was her misfortune that she had not always been good, having been with a man when only fourteen. Then, too, she had often helped her mother empty a bottle of anisette. But she had learned a few things from experience. He was wrong to think of her as strong-willed. Her will-power was very weak. She had always let herself be pushed into things, because she didn't want to hurt someone's feelings. Her one hope now was to live among decent people, for living among bad people was like being hit over the head. It cracks your skull. Whenever she thought of the future, she shivered. Everything she had seen in life so far, especially when a child, had given her lessons to remember. Coupeau, however, chaffed her about her gloomy thoughts, and brought back all her courage by trying to pinch her hips. She pushed him away from her, and slapped his hands, whilst he called out laughingly that, for a weak woman, she was not a very easy capture. He, who always joked about everything, did not trouble himself regarding the future. One day followed another, that was all. There would always be somewhere to sleep and a bite to eat. The neighbourhood seemed decent enough to him, except for a gang of drunkards that ought to be cleaned out of the gutters. Coupeau was not a bad sort of fellow. He sometimes had really sensible things to say. He was something of a dandy with his Parisian workingman's gift for banter, a regular gift of gab, and besides, he was attractive. They had ended by rendering each other all sorts of services at the Hôtel Boncoeur, Coupeau fetched her milk, ran her errands, carried her bundles of clothes. 
Often of an evening, as he got home first from work, he took the children for a walk on the exterior boulevard. Gervaise, in return for his polite attentions, would go up into the narrow room at the top of the house where he slept, and see to his clothes, sewing buttons on his blue linen trousers, and mending his linen jackets. A great familiarity existed between them. She was never bored when he was around. The gay songs he sang amused her, and so did his continuous banter of jokes and jibes, characteristic of the Paris streets, this being still new to her. End of second part of chapter 2